my European poem. This poem should be written in English. This poem should be written in German. This poem should be written in French and Swedish and Spanish, my adorable Norwegian. Maybe in Finnish, Danish, and Dutch. Baltic languages should decide for themselves. No Belarusian version for the poem, no Russian version for the poem, no Ukrainian version for the poem. The rest state your choice. This poem should be written in the languages of human rights organizations of those multiple expressed concerns by European politicians. So, shall I get used to the thought that I could be taken to prison by the men wearing black, by the men in plain clothes, by the men with four fat letters on their fat black backs? Otherwise, my country won't gain any freedom, and it could not work anyway, as usual. Shall I take it calmly that I could be beaten and ultimately found guilty for that? Because they would say, I shouted anti slate slogans like freedom or release all political prisoners, though I would not need to shout them out at all, like my Facebook friends and thousands of someone else's friends, in order to be arrested or beaten. I won't have to shout anything, I won't have to do anything, just stand silently, just be. I know. I have to get used to that thought just in case, because it's so likely to happen. Oh my, I haven't saved those telephone yet to whom to contact in case of detention. I can't say that in Belarusian. I can't say that in Russian. I can't say that in Ukrainian, only in English. I'm afraid, only in German. I have angst, only in Norwegian. Jeg er red. That's enough. For other variants, please use Google Translate. The translations should, more or, should be more or less accurate these are not those strange East European languages with their funny Cyrillic letters. I'm afraid, like you would be in my place if you lived in a country that is not free, where they had the same president for 26 years. Oh my God, more than two thoughts of my life I spent under the power of a madman whom I've never voted for. Sorry, it's a long poem, because it's a long story. I spent more than two thoughts of my life under the power of the man I've never voted for, who harassed and suppressed and killed, they say. And when I come to the literary festivals abroad, like that. And when I speak English, I try to tell the complicated history of my country when I'm asked, as if I'm another person, as if I am like all those European poets and writers who do not have to get used to the thought that I could be arrested and beaten for the sake of their country's freedom. As if my ugly history is just a hush story that I can easily cut from the anthology of modern European short stories because it's too long and too dull. When I tell it in English, I want to pretend that I'm you, that I don't have that painful experience of constant protesting and constant failing, that nasty feeling of frustration and dismay. I want to pretend that I have a hope. Because when I tell it in Belarusian, I realize, we all realize, there is none we can look forward to. So forgive me, my nagging in a half-broken English, my Eastern European never-ending complaints, as having read the books you've read. I still want to have a hope. I still believe I have a right for a hope, that bitten hope that builds its nest on my roof and sings its songs in Belarusian, not in Russian. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Franca Hummels. I'm a journalist from the Netherlands and I'm specialized in Belarus. And we're going to have a talk with three people, we'll call them activists, call them active um, civilians, call them whatever you want. Um, before 2020, I really often got a question when I did interviews or panels or everything, and it's like, why don't they just go out on the street and protest? And from a Dutch perspective, that makes sense, because if you don't say you're not happy with something, how could it ever change? But it's not that simple from a Belarusian perspective. And I'm going to try and explain a bit about that, and I'm not going to use the Netherlands as a mirror, as a positive mirror, because it's not necessarily so, and we, there's a lot we can learn from the people at the table. But just to be, to, to be aware what the Belarusian situation is like, I'm also going to state some things that are obvious, but I'm stating them anyway, because it will be top of mind when you listen to them. 
So, a long time ago, <laughs> in the beginning of this century, when I became active in Belarus, I was a member of the Dutch Union of Students, and I was a, an elected member of the student council of my university. I got paid to do that by my university. University organized those elections. In Dutch law, education law, the students had rights uh, how much they could decide upon in this university. People saw us in the Netherlands, they saw us sometimes even as career builders. We did it, I personally did it from idealistic um, reasons, but yeah, being involved in student politics in the Netherlands can kickstart your career for sure. We did a project with the Belarusian Student Union, which got prohibited during our project. We started with them to build independent student councils in Belarusian universities. What they were doing, those young students, was highly illegal. And also, they asked us questions in this project, like, what did we do if secret services get involved in our project? And well, for us, it was like, um, hmm, maybe it's not for me to answer this question, because I honestly have no idea. Those people were young. They were like 17 or 18. But by being involved in this project, they already made the choice like to be opposition, because if you express that you want change, you also express that it's not good as it is, and that's criticism towards the regime. So it's, it's, it's really a, a bigger um, uh, thing than you would envision from the Netherlands. Um, and then, for example, if you um, do something that the regime doesn't like, and that might be something big like going out on the street and call for democracy. It might also be something smaller to ask your university for changes or suggest that things should be better in the city. You could be called to, be called to KGB. And I'm not joking by saying KGB. It's still called KGB like it was in Soviet times, like you see in James Bond movies. And the Secret Service is very present. It's, they have offices in companies, they have offices in universities, and you could be called to them, and they could threaten you. They could threaten you to, well, th to make it impossible for you to graduate. They could make it, uh, they could just suggest that your mother might lose her job. And you know that also if you really become very active um, against the regime, you might end up in prison, or you might even, uh, or in a, a psychiatric institution, or you might even end up killed in suspicious circumstances. Of course, when you look at the numbers, this does not happen to everyone, definitely not, but it could happen to everyone. And that's something that's important to be aware of for a Dutch audience, because we tend to think that repression is aimed at people who speak out, who do things that the regime doesn't like. And of course, that's also true, because of course they want to get rid of those people and they want to look them up. That's that's one of the things that this repression means, but this repression is mostly aimed at people who don't speak out yet, to just make sure that they will not speak out, because the price is too high. And even before 2020 in Belarus, a lot of people were aware that it was a dictatorship and they did not like it. You could say, more or less, I'm hugely exaggerating now, but there were three groups. One group who either totally believed the propaganda or was just plain evil and supporting the regime for that, a second group that disliked the regime, spoke out to it, did actions, was in high risk. And a middle group, people who knew that something was wrong, but either did not want to act upon it or did not even want to think about it, because if you think about it a lot, you might also want to act upon it, and it's a big risk, and you would just not be political at all, even though you know it's all shitty. So why don't they go out and, and demonstrate? Because the risks are too high. For the, if you're in the Netherlands and you go out to demonstrate, well, it takes time. You have to go there by train, you need to find a place to park your car, it might rain. It's a hassle. In Belarus, after you demonstrate, it is a change of your life. Your life will not be the same afterwards. So why don't people go out and demonstrate? Because the price is really high and to actually have revolution, to actually be massively involved. In Dutch we have, um, the words are sisters, you need both um, hope and vanhope, hope and despair. And um, you need hope because if you don't believe that anything can change, why would you take such a risk? 
and you need despair because if you feel that you're at the bottom, you have nothing to lose. If you are not at the bottom, you can think that maybe protesting will make you even think deeper. And in 2020, both ingredients were there. So uh, in 2020, people um, in the whole the world were preparing, uh, were dealing with this pandemic. And in Belarus, a lot of people thought that as long as I keep my mouth shut, I can, I am safe. I can live my life. But then Belarus government did nothing to protect people against pandemic, like zero. People started to do it themselves, crowdfunding for um, medical protection for doctors, for example. Um, but they also felt like, okay, so even if I keep my mouth shut, I'm not safe. So that was hitting rock bottom. And the other thing was hope. There were elections and there were some new candidates who broke with the tradition. Um, and when the process of registering for elections started, they need a lot of signs. People went out on the streets and they had long lines to sign for candidates. So they also saw that there was a massive want for change. And that gave hope, like maybe this time is going to work. So that's why people in 2020, I'm exaggerating, of course, I can only be brief, but that's why the ingredients were there for revolution in 2020. As you probably all know, most um, candidates were denied access to the ballot, were either put in jail or had to leave the country. Svetlana Tichonovskaya, her husband, could not be on the ballot because he was in jail and she decided to try herself in her husband's place. And she was accepted at the ballot because, probably because the regime thought they could laugh about her because she was just a little housewife. Well, <laughs> that was a big mistake for them, I guess. Um, and she, uh, so she was on the ballot and she teamed up with other political groups. They have very different political ideas, but they really agreed on free all political prisoners have democrat democratic elections. And well, the elections itself, we know as a fact that Lukashenko did not win the elections. We also know as a fact that it's very, very highly probable that Svetlana Tichonovskaya won the elections, but it cannot be proven because the evidence has been destroyed, because again, there were falsified elections. People knew that. Their vote was stolen. For a lot of people, it was the first time that they felt that their vote was stolen because they never voted that passionately before. People went out on the streets. And after a few days, the police started to be extremely violent. They were even taking people into uh, vans and put them, in, um, uh, put them in prison if they were not protesting. And that, even, that actually made the movement bigger because um, even people who would vote for Lukashenko would think like, yeah, okay, but you cannot beat my son. So really the population as a whole turned against Lukashenko and he could not contain it. So he went to ask for help for someone who could contain it, Putin, who already was very influential in Belarus and now is even more uh, influential. And between February 2022 and August 2020, Belarus has deteriorated in a massive way. Like you could say it went from a police state to a military dictatorship. You can get jailed if you wear white and red socks. I'm not joking. You can get jailed if you write condolences for someone who died killed by the police on the social media. Um, it's, it's really bad. And this Russian influence, there was this military exercise which brought a lot of mil Russian military to Belarus. Well, we know what they were exercising for now. And they started to um, attack uh, Ukraine also from Belarusian soil. And it's important to really realize that it's not that you really have to distinguish between Belarus, the regime, or Belarus, the people, because they are like almost opposites in this case. Belarusian regime allows Russia to do this, enables Russia to do this, Belarusian people hate it. They feel guilty because, well, they do not dare to take the risks to go to jail. They didn't want to pay the price to go to jail and the revolution somehow became less, and, they, um, and because of that, Ukrainians have to pay the price with their life because they didn't kick out the dictator. That's not true, of course, but it's something that people feel like that. And they also feel like, how can this happen for my country? So you see a lot of actions again in Belarus, and it's often very direct. For example, if you are a real worker, 
I mean, going to demonstrate, it's a choice you make. You could also think, oh, well, there are so many people going. Do I have to go? And I also need to clean my house. And by the way, also my grandma, she's a bit ill. Let's go there. But when you are a railway worker and you can either let a train with weapons that are going to kill Ukrainians go through or stop it, you have to make a personal choice for yourself at that spot. And you see that a lot of Belarusians make those choices against the war. And Belarus is really... Belarus, when I talk about the two Belaruses, Belarus, the people, they are really um, fighting against the war. And they also speak about double, double occupation because Lukashenko is in power. They don't want Lukashenko in power, so the country is occupied by Lukashenko. And then Lukashenko allowed Putin to also occupy the country. Is there anything positive to say? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid <laughs> everything has turned a lot darker than it used to be, but speeches like this should end with something positive. And actually, well, there's one thing. Society used to be, in Belarus, used to be very much top-down. Like in the Netherlands, football clubs, we organize it ourselves. We start it, we organize everything, and then we ask for money from the government to do what we already were doing. In Belarus, it has always been the opposite. Only in villages, you would have this community sense, maybe. But those people, all those people who went out on the streets or in diaspora or everywhere, they met each other, they found each other, and they are organizing massively. And this is something that cannot go away. This is something that's going to stay whatever happens. So mostly the story is negative, but hey, I'm ending on a positive note. Anyway, Jivje Belarus. Yes, uh, welcome in the Bali, uh, and I also say welcome to the people who follow us via the live stream. Uh, my name is Marlijn Geurts, I'm program editor here at the Bali, uh, and I will be moderating this first conversation of So Far Yet So Close. It's a full day of programs in which you speak about activism, about the fight for democracy in Europe, and of course the war in Ukraine, and this all from a Belarusian perspective. Um, because, like often is said, that Belarus is the last dictatorship in Europe, and it seems sometimes far away, but it's sometimes much closer than we think. Um, this conversation will be about activism, about what it means to be part of a democratic movement, uh, how that looks like. Um, and I'm joined here at the table at three with th three people who are part of this movement. Uh, Julia Tsimafieva. Uh, she is a poet. We just heard her. She's a translator from Belarus. And um, she has been written this book, Minsk Diary, about the protest in 2020. And it's also translated in Dutch, Dagen in Minsk. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have Ilya Sharvitsky. Um, he moved to the Netherlands when he was 13, and he's very active here in uh, bringing together the Belarusian diaspora. He's organizing all protests that you see here in Amsterdam or around the Netherlands. And he's also one of the co-organizers of this program. And we have Franka, uh, Franak, sorry. <laughs> I'm almost Franka. Uh, Franak Fiatschak. He has been fighting for the Belarusian cause actually his whole life. And now he's senior political advisor to Svetlana Tsikhanovska. Franca just told uh, about who she is. Uh, she's the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Movement, and she was here a month ago. And also, Franak was uh, with her, so welcome back. Um, yeah, welcome to all of you. Um, Fra uh, Franca told already a bit about why we have to speak about Belarus, but because this is the first program of the festival, and I thought we have to make clear why we are doing this together. Uh, Ilya, can you say to me why you think it's important to speak in the Netherlands uh, or to speak even in Western Europe about Belarus? Uh, th thanks so much, everyone, for coming, and thanks um, uh, for hosting this event. Uh, I think it's important to talk about Belarus uh, because you can see how um, democratic uh, powers can lose, uh, deteriorate quite fast if you don't act on it. Uh, we had an ability in Belarus maybe to, to make a change or to mm -hmm. start the path to democracy in 2020, but uh, without actual uh, doing anything in Belarus, you, can, you could not handle it. So you have to see in Europe uh, uh, and reflect on Belarus. Okay, what can be done in Europe to also improve democracy? I know, democ I know our uh, topic is called how to save democracy, but the thing is also uh, we can also look at at saying how to improve democracy by looking at the Belarus and seeing what can fail. Let's see, not giving too much power to military, not giving power to the police, to, into becoming a police state, because you see it now in Europe, in Hungary and Poland, that can be the case uh, if you just let it go. 
uh, for a couple of years, and then uh, some people come into power, and you are not. Um, how can I say this? And agree, and agree, uh, agree with them. So this is important to reflect, and we, if we can reflect in the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands we have also issues with politics at the moment, uh, uh, and if we can reflect on that and improve democracy here, it, uh, it will benefit everyone around uh, in the country and all the countries around in the area. Yeah, and, and, and if you say um, we have also stuff to work about here in the Netherlands, yeah. do you feel that, like you are living here already for a very long time, yeah. do you feel that we care about democracy here? I think uh, in less and less. I think the, the participation of the Dutch people with democracy is not that high. Uh, you know, uh, there is 40,000 people affected by Tuslag affair. That's, that's a lot of people. And I don't see big protests on the streets uh, going around and supporting those people. You're actually a bit of surprised about that. Yeah, I'm surprised about that. And it is, it is kind of wondering, oh, well, you know, the, the, the system will fix itself. There's kind of, there's still trust in the system that it will fix itself, but people are not participating to fix the system. People are just blaming things on Twitter. They will blame anyone on Twitter and uh, the, the thing that's, that's actually done enough. And it's a bit lazy. It's a bit lazy. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Franak, um, how do you listen to this? Because like, as an advisor of Svetlana, you're like, traveling around actually all the time. You're speaking to a lot of people all over Europe. Um, how do you make clear to the people you speak to uh, why the Belarusian cause is so important? Like why it's also about them, maybe. Uh, thanks uh, for having me, and thanks Diwali for organizing this important event. I, I never can explain why Netherlands are so interested in Belarus, but I think you can take it as a compliment, mm -hmm. because sometimes you come to the country and people know so little, and there is so little interest, engagement, and uh, willingness to help. But when you come to Netherlands, there are always so many people. Even yesterday, at the reception of American Hotel, the guy, when he knew that I'm from Belarus, said, oh my god, you are from Belarus. You know, I have so many good friends from Belarus. And I understood that this is something extraordinary. And you have to take credit that you care about others, and uh, uh, including about us. So how to, um, how to sell Belarus problem? Yeah. Because I would say it's, uh, on one hand it's politics, on the other hand it's a bit of marketing. Uh, because you have to show that Belarus matters. And I think for ordinary Dutch it's uh, hard to explain. Uh, without explaining the importance of uh, defending common values, there is no many connections between our people. So we have to, first of all, to, to find the ties, the connections, and to explain that when Belarus will change, we can do this and that together. Some in, we, in some countries, when we travel with Svetlana, uh, we make research in advance, trying to find out what historical ties we had, what common writers or theater pieces we made, what heroes of your country were in Belarus. For example, in Iceland, which doesn't have any connection to Belarus, we found the connection that in... We're really trying we very tried hard, hard to get, yeah. We tried hard. So in 10th century, there was the, uh, <laughs> the guy from Iceland who, was, uh, who baptized uh, part of Belarus. Uh, Torvald Konradsson. Uh, we found him in Iceland. People say, yeah, but he was, but, but he was so uh, cruel. Uh, he was, uh, he forcibly baptized people in the world. We say, yes, but you know, but he did it before Russians. Uh, and, and they say, wow, so we did it before Russians. We played so important role in your history. And they promised to put the monument in Reykjavik uh, to, to, to Torvald for, for the next visit of Svetlana. So this is, uh, these are small symbolic historical cultural things that help to sell Belarus narrative, uh, besides values and yeah. uh, common, common fight for values. And also, that's the common vision of the future. That's perhaps uh, the case of our neighboring countries. Because right now in Baltic states, in Poland, in, of course in Ukraine, there is discussion how the Europe will look like after war, in the future. And they draw the map. And in this map, always Belarus is the black uh, zone, the black hole, and we say, Look, if we'll uh, succeed, you know, this black hole will become your... Not if, not if. When, yeah. when. <laughs> it will become your strategic partner. It will be not the black uh, hole, it will be colorful, uh, inclusive, open, uh, friendly, 
um, uh, nation state. And uh, this is what we are fighting for together. Yeah, yeah. Julia, how is that for you? Because um, the poem that you uh, read in the beginning, that's your first poem in English, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you, um, in the book you describe how the poem got a lot of reactions. Um, were you surprised by that actually or not? Uh, I also would like first to say thank you for inviting me here. At the moment, since uh, August 2021, I have a lot of connections now to Netherlands, though I've never been to a country before. Thank you. And I'm very happy to be here and to speak about Belarus as well. Uh, so that's true. The, the, my European poem is my first poem written in English, and uh, it was written on the 5th of August, as you could see that from the screen, uh, just a few days before the elections, because, you know, uh, at that time, in August 2020, before uh, all these tragic and happy events, at the same time, um, we didn't see so much interest from the so-called Western side or from uh, European Union side uh, to uh, candidates for candidates for presidency uh, had already been imprisoned and uh, journalists were arrested, people in the streets were arrested, just people on the bicycles were arrested and uh, the, world was, the world kept silent about that and at the same time uh, we Belarusians, uh, uh, those uh, those who have been uh, fighting or knowing about that fight for many years, as I also took part in the protests uh, before 2020, uh, so we we suspected that something could happen, and uh, uh, on the one hand we were a bit, uh, let's say not pessimistic, but we were so much afraid to, to express our hope because we failed so many times before. We had failed so many times before. And um, uh, that's why I found the only way how to speak about uh, my, um, my willingness to have a hope in English language. But on the other hand, uh, that was also a kind of cry uh, for, the, um, for the Western public, also for, mostly for my Facebook friends uh, from the West that could read English. And yes, that's true that this poem got a lot of reaction. And at that time, uh, I also write in this book how I was writing uh, this poem uh, while cooking a soup or instead of cooking a soup. And that, uh, at that moment, I didn't expect that. That uh, I will, I, I could read this poem here, for example, in the Netherlands. No, but yeah. it did happen. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, Franca, she told in the introduction about like what it means to be part of this democratic movement, um, and um, how many repercussions you can get from it. Um, Julia, you said like I joined protests uh, before 2020. Um, did it feel like a really conscious choice? Because if you are there on the streets, there's also a danger in that. Like, how do you make that decision? Well, I guess that maybe Frank, uh, Frank has a bigger experience of protesting, of course. Yeah, we can get to Yeah, yeah, okay, but about <laughs> me. Uh, so, uh, as far as I remember, first I uh, took to the streets in 2001. I know, and uh, I was, how old were you? Uh, 18. 18. I was a okay. student. And yeah. it was the, the first presidential election after uh, Lukashenko was, uh, uh, had been uh, elected in uh, uh, 1994. So uh, that was the protest, and it failed, and then it was 2006, and, and then it was 2010, and uh, other protests, just with clapping hands, for example, in 2011, and so many protests, and we were used to that feeling of failing, maybe. So, uh, and uh, in 2020, it was felt like hope. On the day of uh, elections, we saw how many people uh, were standing in lines uh, to, to give their vote for, mostly for Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, of course. And uh, we saw that uh, actually uh, Belarusians were not indifferent as uh, uh, we people from, uh, I can't say that I was in a position or something, but really that was so. So, so we, we thought that people were just indifferent, they were uh, apathetic to, the, to what was happening in the country, but 2020 showed that that was not true. And so uh, 
I decided that I should also join this movement. We should be there where the history is uh, created. So we also felt like, you know, the, the clock of history just stopped uh, and he, he, it, it, it has been, um, it has not been moving for so many years. And in 2020, it started working again. And so we wanted to just to be part of that history as well. We could not just sit at home or something. That was impossible for me personally. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe for me, uh, I would say like it's a really bravest thing to do. Uh, it's, it is. Uh, it feels as activism, but you said before we started this conversation to me, yeah, but I'm not an activist. So Why not? That's, you know, it's, it's, it's also puts, when you call yourself an activist, it's, it's, it becomes part of your identity. So you identify yourself as an activist and you also uh, take some responsibilities. Maybe I would call myself cultural activist or literary activist because uh, I also, uh, uh, work, uh, I've been working a lot in uh, literary field for, m for many years before. I, I was an editor of uh, an, a mag uh, an internet mag a magazine of uh, translated literature into Belarusian language, for example, and it was also kind of volunteering activism and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you asked me about uh, the danger. Yeah, so because it, it, it felt dangerous. Uh, but we also realized, and that's, it seems clear for me, then the more people uh, take to the streets, the less danger is. Because when, when you are in a big crowd, when there is a million, I don't know what, okay, to, 200,000 people, then it's, it's much more safe than you go when there is only 1,000, for example. Yeah, but, but like if you do that for the first time or do you, if you do that once, there's always the danger that there... Yeah, but that, that was that not something can happen. So that's really, for me, it feels like a big change. But you said, I don't want to be identified by that. I don't want to be... Yeah, then we have millions of activists in Belarus. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just one of them. Okay. <laughs> Would you say uh, that you were a born activist or not? Oi, oi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I definitely didn't have uh, much choice um, because uh, my family was already involved. My mother was a cultural activist too. Actually, that's a very cool definition. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, she was promoting historical music, uh, historical dances, organizes this medieval um, a tournament of knights with all this, you know, swords and uh, all this stuff, and uh, that was really cool because Belarusians were discovering uh, themselves and their history and actually uh, their identity uh, through these cultural uh, activities. And in Soviet time, that was actually the only way in the 80s to promote Belarusianness through the culture because Soviets, uh, Soviet nomenklatura, they didn't see much danger in culture. Um, but regarding myself, I was. Uh, so, somehow, when I when I was born, it was uh, messy in Belarus. Soviet Union collapses. Lukashenko is coming to power. So uh, I didn't have my childhood. Uh, I was at every demonstration, and uh, usually not with my parents because my parents borrowed me to some friends, and then friends borrowed to someone else. And this 55, five years old boy, you know, was always on someone's hands uh, during the protests, uh, crackdowns, police attacks, and um, uh, you know, after such psychological uh, experience in the early childhood, you don't have choice, you know, <laughs> only to continue what what started. And uh, of course, Lukashenko, I remember only elections uh, in uh, uh, 90s uh, when uh, Lukashenko won. Uh, and uh, I, I remember myself, I hated him so much already then, uh, not even understanding what will uh, happen next. But it was, um, it was quite uh, logical, you know, he destroyed the, the parliament, destroyed media, destroyed all alternative organizations. And uh, my first detention was uh, when I was 13 years old, and I was so proud of it. Um, but, but, okay, you say, I, what happened then? Like, you were proud of it, but you, like, what happened? Yeah, what did happen to you? All, all, all the people were somehow detained or arrested, you know, but I was 13 years old. I think I'm old enough to be repressed too. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, at one night with my cousin, I decided to go uh, to make the graffiti thing. You know, when you are in, when you're in school, you know, you're, um, what you, how can you protest? Political stickers and graffiti spray. And we did a lot of great things <laughs> with stickers and sprays. Uh, of course, uh, Lukashenko's police also 
uh, realize that um, kids are dangerous, and they put some patrols, you know, uh, in, in different parts of the city where usually we made this graffiti. So my first night of uh, graffiti making, uh, beautiful graffiti making uh, uh, action, uh, just finished by detention. And uh, since then, I was already very often a guest of police stations, and I knew all the officers by names. Um, so you were not afraid, actually? Like, or you said, like, it's almost normal? You know, until 18 years old, you're not afraid, because they cannot put you in prison. Yeah. So until 18, that's a sweet time, because they arrest you, they keep you, your parents come after you, uh, your parents are fined for you, uh, because you are underage. Uh, but when you're 18, and then responsibility uh, already criminal and other uh, comes, then of course you are much more cautious. And, and, and older people becomes what I realized, you know, they get families. Then a regime starts to punish the families. More older you are, more responsibility you have, and more cautious people become. Therefore, young people in Belarus, and perhaps in 2000s, they were very, very brave. But perhaps it's not the case right now in 2020, because we see people of all generations. And I think the most active were actually middle age, those who remember time before Lukashenko, those who remember time of uh, semi-freedom, and they understand for what they're uh, fighting for. Yeah. I want to add also about uh, teenagers, as even 15-year-olds uh, were arrested by the state in 2020 and were put into prison. And 15-year-olds, uh, uh, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. So it's it's much more strict. Then it's much more strict now. Yeah, yeah. And like, it affected your whole life. I think it, like, uh, also you said, like it's also dangerous for all the people around you. Um, what did it cost you, actually, to, be, to lead this kind of life? It costed me life. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> you just, uh, everyone, I think uh, people in Yulia uh, as well, everyone who is sitting at this table and who, who works in Belarus, they sacrificed a lot. Uh, because this is not something which uh, gives you career perspective. So this is not something which gives you money or recognition. You never know when, we, when it all ends. You can end up in prison for uh, 18 years like Tsikhanovsky just because two years ago he decided to make a YouTube blog. Uh, so it's, um, it's very uh, quite, quite a sacrifice of everyone. We often underestimate the heroism of these people mm -hmm. because it's normal. You know, he's an activist. It's normal that he's, he's in jail. But I think we put everything on the, uh, at the, on the, on the table. Uh, and uh, when you are once engaged, um, you, it's very difficult to get out because then you are already automatically on the blacklist, you know, you cannot find normal job, uh, not normal job, but like at least state job definitely. You are not loyal to the regime, so you, you have to continue working in underground. Once in underground, always in underground. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ilya, um, you're already for a long time in the Netherlands, but you're also really actively, like what I said in the beginning, uh, involved in the protest movement here. Is that just as dangerous? Like, is it also dangerous in the same way like that, that you have the long arm of like how, you do, how they often say that? Like, do you feel dangerous to do that here or not? I think in the beginning uh, I felt no fear because I was like, I'm Dutch, you cannot touch me, uh, nothing can happen to me. Was it also like on young age that you started, like when you were 13 or later? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think uh, the, that came later in my life that I need to do something. Uh, but in recent years, uh, you see less and less people willing to uh, do interviews, do le uh, less media appearances, and it all kind of starts to fall on me or like a couple of people. And then it kind of starts hitting you because they are afraid, and then you kind of feel their fear. Uh, and you try to kind of say, okay, it's going to be okay, but you also need to tell yourself it's going to be okay. Because I cannot travel anymore to Belarus or Russia or anything that is related to those countries. I can try, <laughs> uh, but I don't think it will be very successful and it will be a very long stay there. And uh, since this week, there are now uh, even deeper laws. In, uh, in Belarus, we still have death penalty. And now they have like potential uh, act of terrorism. It's also uh, punishable by death penalty. And this kind of embroils also political activists. So this is, it becomes even more dangerous than ever. Um, 
so yeah, it, it kind of starts to creep on to you, like after a couple of years, and you kind of start to realize, um, okay, this is not just like a thing for a couple of years. It is an endless thing. It is like until we go, I'm gonna be in there until the end, and then if he's gone, <laughs> then I'll be also finished with, uh, I hope, with activism. Uh, and, but then I, I do feel fear, and I kind of also fear for my family in Belarus. Because they're still there. They're still yeah. there, and in Russia. Um, there is a persona I've created online that is hide, hopefully hiding enough of my activism as the admiral. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but you can only do this little, you know? It, uh, we do receive re reports from Bipol, like about potential people maybe coming to the Netherlands to check on you. So we are in contact with the, our security forces to prevent something bad from happening. But it is, uh, you are more cautious. Yeah. You're kind of like, it kind it's always of, there. It's always there. Yeah. yeah. And you are all three now not in Belarus anymore. Well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but you live here. You live in Vienna? Uh, in Graz. In France, okay. In Graz. I'm oh, sorry, Graz. Graz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you are not allowed to go to Belarus back, right, or not? I don't think so. I have 11 uh, criminal uh, articles. Uh, and actually, uh, I knew by accident. Uh, yesterday, there was a news in Belarus media that the son uh, of the prosecutor faced six years in prison. Mm. Six years of prison because he passed the document to myself and to Stepan Putila that we have 10, uh, back then uh, there were only 10, not 11, criminal articles. So basically the person who informed us about mm -hmm. this proceeding, he is about to receive six years of... Only passing... Only passing one document yeah. informing us because we didn't know that we have this... I have treason, I have mass riots, I have extremism, a lot of uh, interesting stuff. And uh, uh, I think um, mm, it's not a good time to come back, but it doesn't mean it will not happen uh, this year, for example, because I don't know how you see the situation, but I think that like, Lukashenko is uh, psychopathically scared right now. He is very uh, fragile, and you know, all his statements, these controversial um, messages he sends all the time, gives me personally hope. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, uh, uh, either he will be just kicked out by his closest cronies, or he will just, uh, uh, or something happened to him. Uh, <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so, so I have, I have a hope, um, and the interesting thing that it's Lukashenko, you know, who makes mistakes and actually who approach this uh, quick end, quick ending for him. Uh, Ryanair hijacking this Monday, there will be anniversary of, uh, of the flight hijack. Uh, I think it was a very important event uh, for Belarus because the world finally realized that it's not only about Belarus, but that it's about entire region. An interesting thing I, I just heard two days ago from Prime Minister Sanchez um, in Spain, where Svetlana Tsikhanovska visited, he said that, you know, uh, everything started from Belarus. If we would be more careful and attentive to, uh, to Belarus, we will predict or we will see what will happen to Ukraine. Yeah. So for many Western Europeans, you know, this, these events are interconnected, and I think it's, uh, it's partly true that perhaps the, another form, another strategy of action back then could uh, turn the history to a different direction. Yeah. yeah, this is also something that we're going to talk about later in other programs. So I want to go big back to this being this part of this protest movement. I was wondering, like, um, there are so many people from Belarus who are forced to leave the country and are now not inside Belarus. Um, is that actually a problem for the protest movement there? Because there are so many people outside of the country right now. Or is it actually maybe helping? I think it's helping, uh, and also you, uh, you have to realize, like Julia said, there's a million activists. Not everybody left. There is still a lot of people remained who, are, who did oppose the regime, who are still opposing the regime. There's still people doing small parts of their, uh, uh, there's the paper delivery. We have the, the alternative paper that being delivered to people with actual news, with the real news. So there's still a lot of activists remaining in the country. And I think it's also uh, uh, helpful that people left because now they actually can enjoy the freedoms. Even if they are living somewhere else, they can actually uh, learn the freedoms and how it all uh, works out. 
Because once they come back to Belarus, I think eventually a lot of people will come back to Belarus, they will come back with a lot of knowledge. Yeah. A lot of knowledge how things work in other countries. And uh, they can also see which things do work in other countries and which things do not work in other countries. And this knowledge they can bring back to Belarus and it will be uh, also influential in new Belarus, I think, in the future Belarus as well. Yeah. And do you sometimes feel also guilty that you're not there? Because I still, it's a weird feeling, I guess, sometimes. Well, I will try to answer the question. Um, my husband, uh, writer Alger Bakharevich, and me left Belarus in November, at the end of November 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, at the end of the year, I felt guilty very much. So that was one of the main feelings that I felt. Um, uh, because um, even in November and a bit in December, the protests still were going on, though they were not so um, um, populous and uh, not so many people were uh, taking part in them. There were um, people were scattered in the city, in Minsk mostly, because in the small cities there were no protests. But then uh, in 2021, more and more people started uh, leaving the country and I guess the the feeling of guilt was not uh, the one that we had to have, I guess. So at the moment, uh, I miss my family a lot. My family is also uh, in Belarus and uh, my parents, I mean, and my brother, my younger brother is in prison, for example. He's a political prisoner and his wife, together with his wife, they're musicians and uh, they um, played music at the protest in August 2020 and they got a year and a half in prison. So I'm also uh, aware that I could also go to prison. I do not have this long list as Franak, and I don't know anything, but still uh, I wouldn't go up there. So I, I guess that at the moment guilt is not the, the uh, feel that, feeling that we should have. It's not productive. You yeah. should uh, do something with that. So you should act instead of feeling guilty, I think. Yeah. And one of the things that you do, of course, is writing about it. Um, I wanted to ask you to read a small part about uh, your days in Minsk, or uh, Minsk Diary in English. Um, please go ahead. Uh, the 1st of October. I walk along the roadway of Nizalezhnesti Avenue in Minsk and cry as loud as I can. Ooh, ha, di, go away. You, my husband, is by my side. As, a, as there are thousands of men and women of all ages and professions, flags and slogans, hands raised up, voices roaring and vigorous. We believe, we can, we will win, we shout, and Lukashenko to the prison van, and the city is ours. We walk together, one large diverse body, waving its white, red, white winds, fluidly moving from one street to another, avoiding the military cordons. I feel safe and say, inside the body of the crowd. I've never heard of any cases of pickpocketing or any kind of violence at the demonstrations. People distribute bottles of water when the day is hot and dispense food. You can easily be caught by policemen on your way to the rally or after it, when the protest body is weak, but inside of it, the masked man won't touch us. Back in August, in the first days after the election, people walked freely in the streets with flags on their shoulders and held high over their heads. Then, the government decided to get rid of the surplus of democracy. Every Sunday, set with the news that dozens of military trucks full of riot police, water cannons, and special assault barrage complexes are heading for the city from the suburbs. Soviet monuments and main squares are defended by soldiers and encircled with barbed wire. Central shopping malls and metro stations, 13 out of 20 Nyla Sunday, are closed for security reasons. Streets are cordoned off, public transport stopped. Mobile internet is switched off. The city center is paralyzed. When a young foreigner heard about the situation once, he asked, what about economy? Actually, I told him the government doesn't give a damn about economy. This main thing is to prevent us from speaking and gathering freely. When we leave the house, we go prepared. First, I dress carefully in case I end up spending a night or two in the detention center. Second, I intensively water dozens of my flowers. Third, we leave our cat enough food for a few days. 
One of my friends says that her cat has become fat with all the Sunday rallies. Fourth, we take passports and a bottle of water. It's important, too, to clear the history of your mobile phone, and there are mobile checks as there are mobile checks in the detention centers. Now, ready, our small family brigade goes out into the street, into the unknown. That was about the 1st of October, 2020. Yeah. The situation worsened uh, just in a few weeks and months. And um, it's different than the work that you wrote before, uh, sure. because it was more poems that you wrote and you were translating. Um, when did you decide, like, I'm going to write it down? Uh, well, it's a bit of a um, long story, let's say. So this text, uh, the 1st of October, I wrote for Financial Times a newspaper who addressed me and asked for an essay about um, the protests in Minsk. Uh, and it was just one text uh, published, uh, but then in English. But then uh, this text was uh, translated into Swedish and published in uh, Dagens Nyheter, one of the biggest Swedish newspapers, and a uh, Swedish publisher from uh, Nostad uh, contacted me and asked for more. He asked me, do you have more diary? We want to publish it. And I said, actually, I didn't have. I had only this text. But at the same time, I think that uh, many people uh, back then in Belarus felt that we knew everything what was happening every day. We could just tell what was happening. We, we knew about these events. It was, at that time, it seemed that we could remember these things forever. But that was not true. We forget yeah. much. And so I decided that I want to write that, even if I do not have that. And uh, the publisher gave us... Uh, me and my tr translator, Ida Böriel, Swedish translator, uh, gave us two weeks for that. And we managed, and I wrote that book in English as well, and it was published in uh, Sweden. Uh, just a few days, maybe just a few weeks after we left Belarus. And then back in, uh, then in Graz, I started working at that book uh, further, and I also wrote about August. I took my chats that Telegram chats, I, I saved this history, also Nechta TV channel, uh, Telegram channel, just to, to remember the, the, how, how the things were uh, developing, and uh, also wrote about March, uh, also wrote about November, about Roman, um, uh, about Roman Bandarenka. Roman Bandarenka's death, yes, and our visit to the uh, Changes Square, and also I wrote how we how we lived in uh, exile, as we were writers in exile in Graz, and we are. And so this book uh, appeared this way, and uh, thank to, and this uh, Dutch book uh, appeared also thanks to Franka Hummels, who uh, helped, uh, who, who read that book in German, and uh, talk to the publishing house. Yeah. And how, how do you see it for yourself, like how your work relates to the whole protest movement? Because you say, I'm a cultural activist. What do you mean by that? Uh, that I'm working uh, in the cultural field mostly. So uh, what we can, we can, uh, of course, we can read books, we can uh, read books and also write books and uh, translate books and uh, write poetry. Uh, but we also can uh, speak to many journalists. We can uh, write essays or pub um, text that could be published in newspapers. So that, that's what I mean by that. So at the moment, I'm not going out into the streets or something, but I'm, I'm working in this field. I'm working with culture, with literature. And uh, actually, a lot of things could be done. And word actually matter. So words actually matter, and they can also influence a lot of things. And I mean, and I also think that uh, what we are doing now, speaking about the situation, so it also brings more attention to Belarus, and it also makes Western, at least I hope so, makes Western politician, uh, politicians not to forget about Belarus and to act as well. Yeah, yeah. And how do you see that? Because, um, like, you had a, we heard protest songs in the beginning when people enter this room. Um, there's a lot of art, uh, visual art that is made. Like how important is that role of art in this whole protest movement? I think, I think it's uh, quite important. I think uh, as Fra Frank, uh, Frank mentioned, 
we were discovering cultural identity. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of uh, Belarusians um, were kind of lost in the meaning, are we Russians? Uh, what are we? Uh, where is the identity of Bel Belarusians? I think uh, the word is also very powerful because we have a lot of propaganda, mm -hmm. you know, Russian propaganda in, in Belarus about everything. So everything is being propagandized. You, you cannot really believe anything they say, so you need to find the truth, and the truth of the, uh, the words really matter. And finding your cultural identity has also been part of this protest. I think we're protesting two protests in a way, the government mm -hmm. and uh, how to be a Belarusian. Like what, what does it mean to be a Belarusian? What are our uh, songs? What is our poetry? Well, and, 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 and like the songs, you chose the songs that we heard in the beginning. So to make it a bit more concrete, what, what kind of songs are these? What, what, is, what is it about for you? Well, I think the first one is about changes. It's uh, uh, from Toy about actual changes. I think that song was in the 89, also kind of the main song. And so it kind of came back because we had the square of change and a lot of things were connected to changes. And second is uh, Lyapis, which is um, a band artist in Belarus. He, he been protesting Lukashenko for like, I don't know, uh, 10 years now with a lot of songs about freedom. Uh, and he has a couple songs even in Belarusian. But also since 2020, we have new songs coming in Belarusian, more and more. Uh, we have artists that have been discovered, uh, singers, um, and they are actually touring Europe to, to, to go on concerts. And I think this is an important part of uh, re, uh, finding Belarusian soul and finding what it is to be Belarusian. To see the art, see that we have amazing artists, see we have amazing writers, see that we have uh, music, our own music. And I think it's, uh, it's a nice discovery part of the process. And I think it's nice to appreciate also part of that. It's not just the protest part, but also appreciating uh, the art, uh, how the protest signs were so creative. I think there were just like, <laughs> there's uh, been just creativeness all around, going around uh, every day in Minsk at the time, or around Belarus even. <laughs> what did you say about Belarusian language as well? So not only Belarusian culture, but also um, first it started as political protest, of course, mm -hmm. but then uh, and now it also um, we, we see the, revi the revival of interest towards Belarusian language culture as well. And it's very important for me as a Belarusian uh, language author and uh, people also uh, after, after the war in Ukraine started by Russia. So we see also that some people started, uh, more Belarusians started speaking Belarusian language and uh, using it on Facebook at least. So in their Facebook post, Facebook, because it's mm -hmm. very popular in Belarus or for Be Belarusian uh, citizens. And so we see this interest as well. And it's also very important uh, for this identity that Ilya is speaking Belarusian language. And is it for you um, when you're thinking about stuff you want to write, do you think it in Belarusian or not? Yeah, so I'm writing poems in Belarus. I go and write in poems in Belarusian language. Yeah. 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 And I would say that in, in Belarus also, uh, we have uh, most, of the most of the citizens are bilingual. So uh, all people in Belarus study Belarusian language at school, but maybe they can't use it as, as uh, freely as Russian, but at least they can read, and it also gives uh, um, them this impulse maybe to, to uh, refresh uh, the knowledge from school and, yeah. I don't uh, I agree about the language. It's super, super powerful tool, powerful weapon, but it's also antidote to uh, Russian propaganda, disinformation. It, uh, it's like a glue which is strengthening identity because the language is in all spheres of life, in bureaucracy, in culture, in education. And if we will be speaking, if we will have more Belarusian language in life for dictators, for, for again, Russian propaganda, this will be much less chances to, uh, to manipulate identity and reality. Even on technical level, you know, when you speak or write on Facebook Belarus language uh, bots, uh, they are absolutely armless mm -hmm. because, you know, they are programmed to answer only in Russian language and sometimes their comments are very abstract, usually, you are a spy, you are CIA, we will kill you. But when you answer them in Belarusian, they are somehow paralyzed because they are not programmed to respond <laughs> to Belarusian language. And also interesting thing about this picture, uh, I'm just looking at this and I'm still... Um, 
uh, how to say, puzzled. Um, because I remember first protest in summer when Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya was at the stage and no Belarusian flags. And suddenly, more and more, and at some point, these huge flags appeared. And that, that this is a puzzle, who made it? Who made them? Because there were hundreds of huge white, red, white flags. It means either someone prepared in advance mm -hmm. for the revolution, because to make this flag, it takes weeks, even months. It's huge. It's very difficult work. You no, know? you just sue yeah. with a sue no, machine. No, it's a couple days. I can do that. It's a couple of days. It's a couple the days. big yeah. one, the big one, you know, it, it's, it's very big, big work. So uh, either Belarusians are, uh, we are very well prepared to the revolution uh, or very quickly self-organized in order to organize this manufacturing of huge white, red, white flags. And I'm really proud of these people. I hope one day we will know their names. Uh, but this um, one flag actually could be in the Guinness record book because it, it was the length like 10 or 12 uh, um, store, uh, or stores. Mm -hmm. oh, just like 12 they years. just put it on the sky, skyscraper, Belarusian skyscraper, like mm -hmm. 15 floors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that, was, that was amazing. And I, I think Belarusians in general are good partisans. This is the word which is often used right now towards uh, railway partisans. But I think uh, it describes you know, the mood that it's like the small fire, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is still there inside. It might be small and visible. And cultural activists, you know, politicians, diaspora, they support this fire. And at some point, this fire became the huge one. And in 2020, it was uh, all over the country. But you have always to keep this fire. And cultural activists, intelligentsia, you know, volunteers, uh, different NGOs and media, they keep this fire. They hold this fire alive. And this is perhaps our task right now, mm -hmm. after 2020, to, to, to hold this fire until the new uh, moment. Yeah. And how do you do that? Because you are speaking all this time about this 2020. Something happened there. Like, there were so many people who didn't join those protests and suddenly thought, yes, we do. And they were so massive. And just for people so that they understand, like, why you explain that it didn't work? Because you were almost there and everybody had that feeling. Um, what happened that it didn't succeed in the end? It's a question to me? Or yeah, but to, yeah. Um, Again, I don't think uh, we can say we succeeded or not, yeah. because it's still in the process. It's still going on. Yeah. yeah you know, like um, you went to forest and you want to make the fire, you know, to prepare, I don't know, food or fish. And um, every, it seems that everything is good. The fire is almost there and you now you will be um, warmed. But uh, then, you know, the terrorists uh, came and put a whole bunch of water on your fire to destroy everything you have made. And your goal, and you don't have like this uh, Zapalki with matches, matches or yeah. something. So your goal is to save what you started to do, you know, from these gangs uh, that try to destroy your fire you, you put on. And I think this is what, what we do right now. Uh, so we still have fire, mm -hmm. we still have energy, we still, we did not give up on our idea to make what we, we started to do. We want to finish this process. And uh, we, we just have to recollect, regroup, in order to strike again. It doesn't mean it will be in the same form as it was in 2020. 2020, it was the declaration, it was the manifesto of Belarusians that they want to be Belarusians, that they want to be free and independent. Right now, we have to finish with this political part of, of, um, of this challenge. Yeah, I think it's also good to see that uh, we're fighting a Russification that's been happening in Belarus for many, many decades and centuries, basically. Uh, that doesn't go away within a like, couple of months of protesting. No. You know, that, that is deep uh, in, within the country, and that is Russification that happened. Also, how uh, Lukashenko built his, uh, let's say, empire of uh, his mannerism, that doesn't go away also in a couple of months. Uh, it takes also years to dismantle the system from within. You have to uh, find your allies, you find a, a need to convince uh, the people also within the system that the system is not working and that we have a better system in future, yeah. which you can also benefit in. This also takes time, to, uh, you know, uh, discussions, conversations. Uh, uh, you have to convince people, you have to convince a lot of people to change it. So this, this also takes time. and I'm like. Uh, 
Fernand said, we started in 2020 and it's ongoing process, so we didn't fail yet mm -hmm. and we will, will not fail. We will win. And, uh, it's not if, but when. Yeah, exactly. And it's just going to take some more time because the system he built, it's it's quite hard system to break. Um, but it's uh, he's making mistakes. And it's visible even in his uh, cronies that he's losing it. And bit by bit, um, you actually, we actually have the bipolar, which is like the uh, police people that went to our side. So there are people that are on our side, and more and more of them. It just is going to take a bit more time to get to our end goal. Yeah, yeah. You're writing yeah. down a lot, so. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. A bit. Uh, I wanted to, to say also, uh, by the way, about you, you mentioned this if and when, and I guess why uh, Franek uh, is a bit uh, confused, because in Belarusian, you know, there is only one word for if and when, it's Kali. It's not like in Russian, and maybe that's, that's also <laughs> one of the reasons, maybe. Uh, so we do not have this if, we have only maybe when. <laughs> and uh, also speaking about, I agree with Franek and Ilya that uh, we, we haven't failed, and the, the struggle is going on, and I would like to say a few words about cultural activism that mm -hmm. is still going on in Belarus now. Um, and, and, you know, um, before 2020, culture, uh, independent culture was living its parallel life to prostate culture. We just made an impression, maybe, and it was convenient for us, but maybe it was also needed, that the state uh, was not existent and we didn't interfere into uh, each other's uh, business, let's say. But now we see how word, words actually matter, because um, last month or during the month, four Belarusian independent publishers uh, were suspended from working by the state just on formal, uh, for formal reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, another publisher, also my publisher, who published my poetry book and uh, the books of uh, my husband, Alger Bakharevich, uh, writer, um, the, the publisher decided to open a new uh, bookstore on, on this Monday, and uh, because he was also um, uh, pushed out of uh, their previous office. Uh, and, you know, on, on the day of the opening of this bookstore, uh, the propaganda journalists came, uh, they made uh, a video with him, uh, with the publisher, and uh, also uh, in a few hours, uh, Omon, so uh, police came, uh, and uh, Jan Andrei Januszkiewicz, the publisher, and uh, book blogger, but also um, the, the, the worker of this bookstore, uh, Nasta Karnatska, they were detained. So, uh, and 2, 000, uh, 200 books confiscated and three uh, books taken for an expertise, maybe to, to, uh, to check them for extremism. And uh, actually, Andrei Januszkiewicz published uh, a book that is sold here, by the way, Books, uh, Dogs of Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a novel by, sorry, by my husband. <laughs> I'll get I was to make some promotion. Yeah, yeah. But, but then uh, the next day, uh, the Soviet, this uh, propaganda newspaper wrote that this book was found extremistic. Yeah. You know, so it, it, all these things show how words now matter, how culture matter, and that we should go on with Belarusian language, with Belarusian language books, uh, with art, with music, and so on and so forth. That, and this struggle is still going on. I agree with Ilya and Franak. It's, it's, yeah. And, and you, all three sales, say, like, we need to go on. We need to keep that fire a bit burning. What do you need from people here? To help you actually with it. I think from people even here in this, uh, in this room, you will find on your tables postcards to political prisoners. Uh, there are some explanations to it. Uh, so if you can write a message to political prisoners, that will be already a great start. And, and today in Belarus, we have the Day of Political Prisoner. So yeah. official Day of Political Prisoner for the first time. Also that, yeah, we have a Day of Political Prisoner. Uh, and then there is, all, of course, websites full of information. You can actually, there is, you can also do it via internet. Mm -hmm. It's called Kletichku. Uh, dot by. I think if you just Google Kletichku, you'll find a website where you can just click and send a message to a political prisoner. And there are over... And, and, and why is it so important to do that? It's important because the, these people uh, need support. 
uh, you know, the, the regime is trying to break them in prison because mm -hmm. uh, it does everything against, especially political prisoners uh, uh, in prison. They try to break them, and these people will come out and they will, uh, you know, they will fight again against a dictator. Um, and then you can support the organizations that are uh, fighting for Belarus uh, in your country or in the Netherlands. We have a couple. We're going to have another one as well in the future. Uh, you can go to events like this, uh, naturally support. Go to uh, buy the books. We have books also now in Dutch uh, by a Belarusian artist, in that you can support as well. Um, I think Frank will know more. But to, to add, uh, perhaps um, organizing actually um, events, uh, uh, lectures in schools or universities, that's also important to build these bridges, to build connections, build understanding of each other. Not only, it, it, it works both ways. Dutch Belarusian uh, culture, Dutch Belarusian uh, science projects, Dutch Belarusian uh, information exchanges, everything uh, that uh, strengthen our ties. Um, we discussed in some countries actually lectures in schools, perhaps with film screenings or with poetry reading. That's something that can help mm -hmm. as well for young people, young Dutch uh, people, you know, to understand better Eastern Europe, which becomes more and more important in everyone's life in Europe. And um, that, that could help also creating uh, institutions or strengthening existing ones. Uh, for example, again, in academia, you know, like Belarusian centers or Belarusian language classes, you know, something, if it will be available, then we will see there is demand or not. Because sometimes we hear, oh, there is no interest, there is no demand for Belarusian books or literature classes because uh, we never checked there is or not. You have to create this demand to, to assess, uh, it, it, not demand offer, to assess if there is demand or not. Yeah, yeah of course I agree with what uh, Ilya and Franek uh, uh, have said, but maybe I will also, uh, like a cultural activist, I will say that please uh, influence also your politicians and uh, politicians not to believe Lukashenko anymore. So because it has been done a lot of times, so he has been trusted after one election or another election, and please do not do that. And so that's my yeah. word as a cultural yeah, yeah. activist. Maybe that's for, um, we also spoke about it like a month ago with uh, Svetlana, but uh, you have been like uh, to uh, Mark Rutte, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to some other ministers. Were you actually, um, happy with their promises, because you're quite optimistic. Kink, to kink as well. Yeah. What did they promise you? Like, did they, did they give you enough? Um, so, Netherlands actually uh, have a quite good understanding of uh, Belarus situation and who is Lukashenko. Um, and uh, on the level of uh, prime minister and ministers of foreign affairs, uh, several of them changed since, the, since 2020 already. Uh, and they understand uh, that they need to combine uh, pressure through sanctions with the support for civil society. Um, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, has program which is called MATRA. Uh, it's uh, financial support for media, for cultural activists, uh, for human rights defenders, and they help through the Dutch Embassy in Warsaw. And it's working for many, many years. It uh, supported so many projects. Uh, also, Dutch MFA helps us with uh, training, uh, training on, uh, on uh, like, uh, diplomacy and some other issues. Um, we work with um, uh, some think tanks here. I just don't know if I may mention or not. Uh, so th there, is, there is some uh, practical support. Um, I think what we need, we need uh, uh, more um, projects on, on, on cultural academic level as well, because political support we have full from Netherlands. Netherlands also sponsored two sanctioned packages in uh, Foreign Affairs Council. So I, I can't say anything bad about Dutch politicians. Of course, always could be, uh, could be uh, done more. We are waiting for parliamentary group, Friends of Belarus. They promised to consider one um, months, months ago. Um, we will be asking, of course, for more support for civil society. You also can remind them that they promised. Uh, sometimes you have to double check and follow up. Yeah. So if you can follow up from here, it would be much helpful. Yeah. 
Um, I think for the people watching at home, I would like to close off and thank very much Julia, Franak and Ilya.